so it's been a bit of a crazy um, morning and few days um, in preparation for this service. I, uh, when um, I saw that both Mike and Emma would be away, I thought, oh, this is great. I could preach on Reformation Sunday, get me out of my stewardship slot that I seem to always end up in, although Emma will preach in two weeks. Uh, we came back from Colorado on um, Monday, had a little scratchy throat on Tuesday, cold on Wednesday, Thursday, back at it. Um, and then on my way up, Linda called and she tested positive for COVID. So I took a test and tested positive about half an hour ago. However, I think it's the on the end kind, but you'll notice there's a 15 foot radius around me here of abundance of caution. And I will not be greeting people at the end. So that's a little piece of um, how the craziness has gone. And, um, but what I wanted to say too, before I read the scripture, is that when I looked up the lectionary text for this day, I saw they were very, very familiar. Kate preached a very compelling sermon on them just a few weeks ago. And at staff meeting when I brought it up, she said, oh, is that why when the first time I looked at the text for September 29th, I couldn't make anything of them? But when I looked at them again, I thought, yeah, I can go with this. She turned to the last Sunday of October instead of the last of September and took the test, texts right out from underneath this Sunday. Well, Emma, Emma preached on Hebrews two weeks ago, so I thought, well, you know what? I'll take her gospel text um, today. It's about wealth. So much for staying away from money. But I figure if a third of Jesus' parables are about money, then it's somewhat inevitable, and I'm sure you're not surprised that I'm drawn to these texts like a duck to water. So, first, let us pray in the 16th century words of Ulrich Zwingli. Living God, help us hear your holy word with open hearts so that we may truly understand, an understanding that we may believe, and believing that we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord, amen. The lectionary readings for a Sunday after Pentecost. From the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before Jesus and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake 
and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Here ends our Gospel reading. I'm not sure how many possessions that man had 20 centuries ago, but if it was difficult for the wealthy of Jesus' time to enter the kingdom of God, what hope do we have today? Please pray with me. Speak through me, God. Help my head to understand your words and my heart to know your love that I might be your voice in this time and this place. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, as Ingeborg said, this Sunday before All Saints Day is celebrated as Reformation Sunday in recognition of Martin Luther's penning his 95 theses 507 years ago. I've known that much for a while, but I am mostly a Congregationalist, and my familiarity with Church history is a bit scarce prior to the 17th century. So I've done a deep dive into the 16th century this week. Now, I don't know what image you might have of Martin Luther in your mind. I know for myself I knew Martin Luther King before I knew who Martin Luther was. But when he wrote his 95 Theses in 1517, he was 33 years old and had been a priest for just a decade. Back then they didn't say Catholic priest, it was just priest. There was one church. Well, not exactly. There was one church in the West. There had been the great schism of 1054 that split the Eastern Orthodox Catholic Church centered in Constantinople, from the Western Catholic Church centered in Rome. But that's a story for another day. Martin Luther was ordained by the Church in 1507. He received two bachelor's degrees and began teaching theology at the University of Wittenberg in 1508. He earned his Doctor of Theology in 1512, becoming chair of the department, and he was 29 years old. In 1515, he was made provincial vicar, which meant that he was responsible for 11 monasteries in the region. He sounds like what we might call a rising star today, a young, wise, enthusiastic leader. However, there were a number of things that he didn't agree with, and he was not one to acquiesce. And that's where it gets interesting and consequential. In the German church at the time, if someone committed a sin, they received forgiveness by making a payment to the church called an indulgence. The money was then sent to Rome to rebuild the 4th century St. Peter's Basilica, a capital project that began in 1506 and wasn't completed until 1626. Imagine being on that being. B and G committee. Well, this sale of indulgences to forgive wrongdoing infuriated Luther for multiple reasons, and so he outlined his 97, I'm sorry, 95 grievances to his bishop, writing them in Latin. Number one, when Jesus said repent, he meant that believers should live a whole life repenting rather than expect repentance to be given to them by an external system. That's number one. Number six said only God could forgive, not a priest. But I thought number 86 was especially interesting. It says, why does not the Pope, whose wealth today is greater than the riches of the richest, build the Basilica of St. Peter with the money of, with his own money, instead of with the money of the poor believers. Well, 
Things moved quickly, even by today's standards and all without the internet or FedEx. The bishop didn't respond to the letter, but forwarded the document to Rome within a month. Meanwhile, his theses were printed for distribution within two weeks, and within two months, they'd been translated into German and circulated widely in France, in England, and in Italy, and students started coming to Wittenberg to hear him speak. Well, the Pope put together heresy proceedings, and in 1521, Luther was excommunicated, declared an outlaw, his publications were banned, and if someone were to kill him, there would be no legal consequences. It became a crime for anyone to give him food or shelter. Wow. It would have been much easier to be silenced, but Luther kept writing, and his ideas resonated with the people, and that made all the difference. Clearly, someone was feeding him and sheltering him. Others took up the cause, shared their own ideas, moving beyond what Luther had outlined. And there were riots and rebellion and insurrection, much to Luther's dismay. During Lent of 1522, he returned to Wittenberg and preached one sermon every day, focusing on the Christian values of love and patience and charity and freedom, exhorting people to trust God's word rather than violence to bring about necessary change. Luther's return quieted things down, but not completely. The parallels to our own day are pretty striking, don't you think? Luther tried to walk that line between his disdain for the abuses of wealth and his support of the system. He was a reformer much more than he was a revolutionary. He didn't go so far as to side with the peasants who wanted to attack the nobles. He wrote another piece called Against the Murderous Thieving Hordes of Peasants. And he said, the gospel does not make goods common except in the case of those who of their own free will do what the apostles and disciples did in Acts chapter 4. That's the one where they say, hey, bring all your possessions, put them in, um, in common, and then we'll use them as needed by the community. Well, Luther says they did not demand, as do our insane peasants in their raging, that the goods of others, Pilate and Herod, should become common, but only their own goods. Interesting. Luther wanted people to render unto Caesar what was Caesar's. He said, our peasants, however, want to make the goods of other men common and keep th their own for themselves. Well, without Luther's support, the peasants gave up, and Luther's reform grew within the existing structures. Although he had spoken out against celibacy, he didn't marry due to the threats on his life at the time. However, just three years later, by 1525, he was married, had six children, while he organized a very new church. And then the next year after his marriage, at their convention in 1526, the emperor's authorities concluded that each state should live, rule, and believe as it may hope and trust to answer before God. So we go away from one system into letting each state decide. The next years were a bit tense, but in 1529, the regathering came together, which was called the protest, protestation at Spire, and the delegates voted that they were no longer subject to the secular authority in matters of religious faith. And that's where the label Protestant comes from. Very, very interesting, and I knew pieces of that, but not others before looking and diving into it this week. Luther wasn't the only reformer. He was one of them, and he was one of the older ones. 
At the same time, in Switzerland, Ulrich Zwingli believed that the word of the Bible was a higher authority than human sources. Zwingli believed the Eucharist was symbolic rather than the actual body of Christ. In 1522, while Luther was trying to quiet the riots, Zwingli spoke out against the practice of fasting during Lent. Well, a generation later, John Calvin was born in France, moved to Geneva, trained as a lawyer, and he also set out to reform the church, but his reforms were more centered on governance and liturgy. The mass was abolished in Geneva in 1536. And meanwhile, England had been going through its own issues with Henry VIII eventually achieving the separation of the Church of England from Rome in the 1530s. In 1543, in Scotland, John Knox converted to Christianity, moved to Geneva, learned from John Calvin, and returned to Scotland, leading the Protestant Reformation there. And then also in the Netherlands, a 1581 law repurposed Catholic churches for the Dutch Reformed Church and prohibited public expression of the Catholic faith. I learned about that touring the Museum of Our Lord in the Attic. It's a five-story home in Amsterdam that looks just like all the other homes, but the upper three floors were a hidden Catholic church. So with all of this going on in all of these places throughout the 16th century, the Reformation didn't happen all at once. It didn't happen on that day before All Saints Day in 1507. No, 1517, right? 1517. It was led by a few bold, strong leaders, but it's important to note that it was followed by many. Overall, it was a time of a huge amount of change. Change in the areas of communication and transportation and commerce and trade and science and religion. These changes affected every aspect of every individual's life and affected the life of the community. I do have to wonder, though, whether Luther's writings would have spread so quickly without Gutenberg's development of the printing press in 1450. And they had the means to share those words much more broadly than just the people who heard someone speak. Well, these earliest leaders, Luther and Zwingli, hoped to reform the church, what we now know as the Roman Catholic Church. It wasn't till the next generation, Calvin and Knox, that the split with Rome became real. If you think about the changes, those of you who were raised in the Catholic Church or are familiar with the Catholic Church know that there are a number of differences, lots of similarities, but a number of differences. The Latin of the Mass was replaced by scriptures translated into everyday languages of the people, so that worship was led in the languages the people could understand. Music that had been sung only by the choirs was introduced to the congregations, sparking a great tradition of hymns, Luther's Mighty Fortress is Our God, this, everything we're singing today, the, um, the very familiar Old Hundredth, um, all of those hymns came out of that 16th century. The Reformers challenged this divine human relationship that went from God to the Pope to the bishops to the priests to the people. That linear relationship had provided stability and order for centuries, but the only way to God was through the priests, and the Reformers believed that ordinary people would be able to read and understand the Scripture and receive God's revelation directly. The Reformation empowered individuals, but not for their own independent purposes, but rather for freeing them to serve others and work for the interdependent common good. So how then do we read Mark's gospel against this backdrop of reformation and change and in the midst of our own American uncertainty 
as we cast our votes over these next 10 days. It seems to me that the issue that Jesus taught about was also addressed by Luther and the 16th century reformers and is also very present today that the accumulation of wealth and possessions, whether by individuals or by the church or by the government, that accumulation of wealth and possessions can be problematic for, the in, for individuals. It can be problematic for the common good. Jesus instructed the man to downsize so that he could follow him. Luther risked his life to redirect the money of the poor to their own needs and their own communities instead of to the accumulated wealth of a building in a faraway city. Wealth inequality is most definitely at the root of our current social conflict as well, and the balance between individual responsibility and resources and the way we use them for the common good is a perennial tension. So on this Reformation Sunday, on this T minus 10 days before our election, may we find courage in Martin Luther's convictions and in the beliefs of the 16th century reformers who had hope in the power of the people acting for the common good, acting for the benefit of each other. And may we trust in Jesus' teaching enough to let go of our possessions for the sake of the gospel. Because if we can do that, we will be blessed now and always. Amen.